Now it is our pleasure to present Earl Nightingale, the man who devoted 20 years to the most penetrating research as to why people succeed or fail. The message is a condensation of Mr. Nightingale's best strangest secret. Now, Mr. Nightingale. The purpose of this film is to permit me to share a few ideas with you, a few ideas I've picked up over the past 20 years or so, about the most interesting creature in the world, the human being and the game he plays, the game called life. We all want to play this game well. I know you do, and I do, and our prospects and our customers do, our youngsters do. It's possible to play this game in such a fashion that we can go all through life going from one success to another, uh, knowing the joy that comes from accomplishment, uh, getting the things we want for ourselves and our families, if we learn just a few rules, a few rules about this game. To my way of thinking, the story of a man's life is the story of a search, an odyssey. Uh, it's the most exciting thing, of course, that he can do. I believe that the happiest men in the world are those who know exactly what it is they seek and then uh, devote their lives to uh, making that come true. I think all men are dreamers, uh, but I'm afraid that most men are content to pass off what they consider idle daydreaming and return to what we call the uh, visible, well-marked path in life that they feel must be the best path because it carries the heaviest traffic. The point I want to make today is that the road in life with the heaviest traffic is not necessarily the right road to follow. And usually, usually it's the wrong road to follow. Perhaps the best way to do this is to tell you a little bit about my own road. I spent more than 17 years looking for something that had been published in more than 50 million books, something that was older than the pyramids. It all started for me back in 1933, during the last Great Depression. As a boy of 12, I couldn't justify what I saw around me with what I'd been told. Uh, I had always been told uh, that man was God's noblest creature and that he had dominion over the earth and all its creatures. And yet the people in my neighborhood didn't have dominion over a steady job. Uh, they were poor, yet there was plenty of money around. No one had buried it in 1929. Uh, they had no education, yet it was free and on every side of them. They had very little food, yet it was being raised in abundance all over the country. They lived in inadequate and ugly dwellings, yet there were beautiful homes for sale. Well, it was apparent to me that these people did not have the answer to the problem. They didn't have. As a group, the experts say they never have had. Why? I used to ask them, why are we caught in this, uh, this depression, this fix we're in? It's a very human thing. It seems that whenever a human being doesn't know the answer to a problem, he blames other human beings. They blamed Wall Street or the Republicans or the Democrats or a, uh, a minority group. They didn't know the answer. They repeated what they had heard and thought that would suffice. But that isn't enough. They looked everywhere for the answer except where it really was, within themselves. What I wanted to know was, what separates the haves from the have-nots? I don't mean that strictly in a financial sense, I mean in, in every possible way. But one night on the beach, I got an idea that has made my life exciting ever since. I decided that I'd find out what the secret to achievement was. I reasoned, as a boy will, that someone must have figured this thing out, and if he had, he'd have written in a book for other people to read. So I decided I'd take out a library card and uh, just read right on through until I found the answer. But there was one thing that worried me a great deal. If the answer to achievement were known, uh, why didn't everybody know about it, like the uh, internal combustion engine or the airplane? Well, that bothered me, and it's bothered a great many people ever since. The answer's been given in our universities and from our pulpits, but it was given in a very dramatic fashion not too long ago. I think the answer was best given a few years ago when a, a reporter was interviewing a very great man in London. He was the Nobel Prize winning Albert Schweitzer. The reporter asked the great man, Doctor, what's wrong with men today? The doctor thought for a moment and then he replied, Men don't think. And he was right. That's the problem today. That was the problem 400 years before Christ. It may always be the problem. Why don't men think? And we know the answer appears again and again in the great books. Why doesn't everyone know about it? Because about 95 or more uh, percent of the people never read the great books. We know the answer appears over and over again in the Bible. Why doesn't everyone know it? Nobody reads the Bible. Everyone owns one because it's fashionable, like a set of Shakespeare. They don't read that either, and the answer's in there too. 
The answer appears in the public library on practically every shelf. Why doesn't everybody know about it? Because if you want to hide something from the American people, put it in a public library. They'll never find it. As a group, as a group, as a majority. Well, while it isn't absolutely necessary to have a good education in order to succeed, it's a pity not to obtain one since it's free and we're surrounded by it on every side. But we can still succeed without, without one if we know a few of these rules we're talking about. Why is it that only 5% of the men in the United States succeed in life? For example, consider this statistic. Out of 100 young men who all start even in our country at the age of 25, 100 young men at age 25, 40 years later when they would be 65, one is well-to-do. Four are independent for life. Five are working. 36 have died. 54 are stone broke, dependent on others or an agency for their support. Now, why is this? Anybody could be wiped out. Uh, disease or illness could uh, take away their money, but that isn't generally what happens. They wind up broke as a group because they don't think too much about it. And here's where we, I think, can be of real service. What do they do that's wrong? Now, before we get into that, let's define success. What is success? Success, to my mind, is the, nothing more than the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. By that I mean if we're here and we want to get there and we know we want to get there, uh, we're successful. As long as we know where we're going in life, we're successful. By definition, the people who do not know where they're going, what they're working toward, are then not successful. A survey was made one time with thousands of working individuals, and they asked them this question. Why do you get up in the morning and go to work? 19 out of 20 didn't know, had no idea. Why? Well, the experts claim it's because they conform. Why do they conform? They're taught to conform from the time we were uh, a foot tall, we've been conforming. We're told what to do uh, by our parents, which is natural and good. Uh, we get into school. What's the most important thing to a young fellow in school? It's to be liked by the other kids, right? Of course. He wants to belong to the group, do what they do, laugh at the same things they laugh at. It's only natural. All right, he gets out of school and he generally goes into service. Again, he must conform. In fact, in the military service, they carry conformity to an extent that would uh, shatter the credulity of a low-grade gorilla. But it's the only way you can run a military service. We want them all shooting at the same people. This, again, is perfectly natural. But now we come to the tricky part. This young man is 25 years old. He's out of school, out of service. What does he do? Generally, he goes back to his hometown. That is, if he's single. If he's married, of course, he goes to his wife's hometown. Let's say he's still single. One day, he's standing on a corner in his hometown, and a friend comes up and says, Charlie, uh, what are you doing? He says, oh, nothing. He said, well, why don't you come down and go to work where I work? It's a good place, and they pay regularly. He says, okay, I will. He does, and spends the rest of his life there, and that's the end of him. 95% of all jobs are obtained by random application, which is just another way of saying that the average young man spends more time over the selection of a necktie than he does his life's career. But what happens after he gets on the job? Generally, again, without thinking, he conforms. He begins doing his job the same way all the other fellows are doing their jobs, at the same rate of... Uh, excellence or whatever you want to call it. He doesn't want to be too conscientious. Uh, he might stand out. The fellows might find some terrible way of getting even with him. They might not let him on the bowling team. Or if they let him on the team, they might not let him keep score, but they'd find some way of getting back at him. What does he do then? Generally, he marries. Wonderful. He does the same thing I did. He goes out and gets a little house that looks exactly like every other house on the block. It makes him feel comfortable. For two weeks, he puts a brick in front of it so he'll stumble over it and know which one is his. And then after two weeks, he can remove the brick and he'll just automatically turn into the right house. He gets a little car, looks like the other cars, and now here's the American dream. A 40-hour-a-week job, the highest paycheck in the history of the world. He's got 50 years staring him in the face, 50 years in the golden era that man has been dreaming of since the days of Pericles. Now, what's he going to do with him? Well, he works 40 hours a week. This leaves him 72 hours a week when he's neither working nor sleeping. What does he do with these 72 free hours a week? Almost twice the time he spends on the job earning a living for his family. Generally, he does the same thing with his 72 hours of free time a week that the other fellows are doing with theirs. He does nothing at all with them. On a typical uh, day, he'll get through work and go home and walk in the back door and kiss his wife and say, I'm tired. No one knows why. 
They believe that he says that because his grandfather said it back in the time when people really got tired and it's just sort of been handed down from father to son until he still says it. He eats a very average meal and then usually hurries into the living room where he reaches out and turns on his escape box. The screen lights up and figures and horses and cowboys and things start moving around on there. And so for the next four or five hours, he becomes lost in a world that he must feel is superior to his own or he wouldn't be so quick to jump into it, would he? For four or five hours, he sits there and watches other people earn excellent incomes in the pursuit of their careers while he doesn't make a nickel and gets the only two things you can get from watching television. Red eyes and a hollow head. Oh, there are some wonderful television shows. I watch them myself. I've got a television set. I've got a car too, but I don't go home at night and ride around the block for five or six hours. In fact, there's a geneticist who has said that in ages to come, if things go on the way they're going now, we'll no longer have two eyes uh, like we have now. We'll only have one. It'll be up high on the forehead and it'll be shaped like a television tube. Uh, it'll be up high because we'll no longer have any use for a brain at all. I've been watching my kids and I think their eyes are kind of moving a little bit together. Well, enough of that. For four or five hours, he sits there watching television until his wife comes in, who is a little more practical than he is, and she taps him on the shoulder and says, Charlie, it's time to go to bed. He says, what? Oh, and then he reaches out and turns it off, and he knows how to do that. He just, just turns it off. And then he goes to bed, and the next day, he starts this all over again. He does this for 40 years. At the end of that time, he's retired at 65, which always catches him by surprise, even though he knew it was coming for 40 years. And then he dies at 75 or 80 out of sheer boredom. Now, there's nothing wrong with this if we do it deliberately, if that's the way we've decided to spend our lives. But I think the pity comes when it isn't the way we decided to spend it. The pity comes when we're doing it uh, by default, when we're living that way just because our next door neighbor is. And I think it's time to do a little thinking about it. You see, I believe that everyone owes it to himself to become great at something. And since a man works 40 hours a week, about 50 weeks a year for 40 years, that's time enough to become great at anything. What can we learn from all this? Two things, I believe. One, if we're going to be individuals, we've got to be individuals. We have to have individual goals, individual thinking, and individual actions. Individual goals, thinking, and actions. And number two, we must never conform to the great mass of people. We must love them, we must help them wherever we can, for our success will be determined by the amount of help we can give them. But we should never permit ourselves to become submerged in this suffocating sea of indirection and purposelessness. If we follow the crowd, the odds are 95 to 5, we're going to miss the boat too, because those are the statistics, about 95 to 5. So before we follow the crowd, let's take a look at it. If we flip back through the pages of history, what do we find? Every great thinker and leader from Socrates to the Wright brothers has been ridiculed, laughed at, pilloried, burned at the stake, or crucified. The crowd has made a consistently grisly game of tormenting its saviors. So it's better, I believe, to stand out a little bit as an individual, to belong to society, certainly, but to think for ourselves and act for ourselves. If we want to emulate someone, and this is a wonderful idea, just pick someone worthy of emulation, someone you admire and respect, someone perhaps who's uh, lived before you, uh, someone you know succeeded, do what he did. But don't follow the guy down the block because the odds are 95 to 5, he doesn't know where he's going. Have you ever thought much about this? Wouldn't it be terrible if we were following people who were following us it could happen, you know. Take this fact, for example. This, to my mind, is one of the most overlooked facts in America. We should realize that every single job, no matter what it may be, every single job holds somewhere within it the road to greatness, the key to everything we could possibly want, if we'll only go about it a certain way, if we'll do what Dr. Schweitzer said we're not doing, if we'll think, if we'll think about it and find an application for it. That's all we have to do, to look within the job we now have for the greatness that lies there. And it's there if we look for it. We have a choice of doing one of two things. We can either compete or create. 
If we choose to compete, then let's not squawk about the rewards we get. If we choose to put ourselves on the same level with everyone else in our line of business, then we can pretty well figure that we're going to have minimal returns, because that's just about the way it works out. If we create, there is no limit to what we can accomplish. There is no ceiling. We can do anything we want to do within the framework of our present job and go as far as we want to go. One time a farmer took a little baby pumpkin and he poked it in the end of a one gallon uh, glass jug. And of course it grew in there and flourished and finally it completely filled the jug and can grow no more. And when it was ripe, he broke the glass and he had a pumpkin that looked just like a one gallon glass jug. The moral of the story, of course, is that we do a similar thing with our own lives. We poke ourselves into jugs beyond which we cannot grow. But these limits we impose upon ourselves. No one else does it. Another mistake that I believe the average worker makes is that he thinks he's working for the company. Uh, again, he's wrong. Each of us actually is only working for himself. A great Southern educator tells the story of a wealthy man who was going to go to Europe for several months and he called a builder he knew over to him and he said, uh, here's some money and I've bought this lot over here. I want you to build me a, a beautiful home on that property. And then he left. Well, as soon as he was gone, the builder said to himself, well, with him out of the way, I can uh, probably cut a few corners and make myself a pile of loot on this job. Now, this has been done, you know. So he did that, and he built a rather shoddy house instead of the good house he should have built. And when the wealthy man came back, while well, the builder handed him the keys and said, well, there's your house. How do you like it? And the uh, wealthy man said, well, that's a, that's a beautiful home, but it's yours. I wanted you to build it for yourself and your wife and children. We're in the same boat. Every hour of the day, each of us is building his own house. And it will be strong or weak, beautiful or ugly, depending only on the methods of construction we use and the materials we put into it as individuals. No, each one of us is only working for himself, in the last and final analysis, certainly. Now we come to what I call the strangest secret. The reason it's so important that each one of us decide uh, what it is we want to do with our lives, what our goal in life happens to be. You see, after these 17 years of research, I made, which to me was an amazing discovery. I wondered why is it that people who know where they're going always get there, like a ship at sea. In fact, that's a good analogy. You might get a picture in your mind of a ship uh, in port, and let's say that its next port of call is Sydney, Australia. Now, how much of your money would you bet that it would not get to Sydney? Well, of course, you wouldn't bet anything that it won't get to Sydney, and the insurance companies will bet that it will. Why? Well, ships are pretty smart. They know that you can only sail to one port at a time, never two. If you ask the captain up on the bridge of that ship what his next port of call is, he'll immediately say, Sydney, Australia. Well, men should be the same way. You should be able to ask anybody what his next port of call is, and he should be able to tell you that also. For 99% of that journey, the captain cannot see the port he's trying to reach. But he knows it's there, and he knows he'll get there if he'll just keep doing certain things a certain way every day until he reaches his port of call. Once it's been reached, he can then rest and relax and then set out to a new port. And that's the way our lives, I think, should be. Why is it then that people who know where they're going, like this ship to Australia, always get there? It's what I like to think of as the strangest secret. All of the great men who have lived for the last 3,000 years since the beginning of Western civilization have been great because they've disagreed with one another on just about everything. That's why they were great. They were right, too. But there's one point on which they were in complete, almost unanimous agreement. I believe it's the simplest and yet one of the most profound statements ever written. And it's simply this. We become what we think about. It's really so simple when you get to thinking about it. Yet, what did Dr. Schweitzer say in London? He said, we don't think. Well, if we don't think, how can we get anywhere? We can't. And unfortunately, a large percentage of the people don't. This is why every person must decide why he's getting out of bed in the morning and going to work. What it is he's working toward. This removes all the, the, the doubt, the uncertainty of living. Uh, all the little worries and problems and fears seem to disappear, and a man can get all of his energies together and strike out for that which he wants with the certain knowledge that he will attain it. How does this work? This is an interesting thing. Well, I think the best analogy I've run across is that it works like everything else in nature. Everything in nature begins with a seed, a nucleus. 
And it's the same with the, with, with the mind of man, with the thought that he places in it. Now, you take the farmer's land out here. It doesn't care what you plant in it. It doesn't care at all. It's neutral. It's only governed by one law. Whatever it is you plant, whatever the seed is that you put in that land, the land must return. The little invisible picture that's in the heart of that seed must be brought up and into physical reality. Well, the mind of man works the same way, except that it's incalculably more powerful, more fertile, more incredible than this farmer's land. And the seed that we plant in our mind is our dream, our goal, the thing we want more than anything else in the world to achieve. Once that's been established, once we fertilize it with our enthusiasm and our faith, it must, it will always grow into reality. It has to, there's no other way it can do anything. Every person at this particular moment is really nothing more than the sum total of his thoughts to this point. And five years from now, he'll be the sum total of his thoughts up until that point. So thinking then becomes important. Setting a goal becomes vital. And it can always be done in the job we now have. To me, there's nothing more pitiful than a man who goes through life uh, jumping from one thing to another, forever looking for the pot of gold at the end of a rainbow and never staying with one thing long enough to find it. Let me give you a plan that I guarantee will bring you just about anything you want in the next five years if you can buy it with money. It's an interesting little plan and it shows the power of the human mind. Start getting up an hour before the rest of the family does in the morning. Make yourself a nice fresh pot of coffee and sit down at the kitchen table or in your den with a clean sheet of paper and think of 20 ideas for improving what you now do for a living. Not some strange inventions or something, but 20 ideas on what you now do for a living. 97% of these ideas will be worthless. We know that. But some of them will be good. You'll be getting 100 ideas a week if you don't think on weekends. Now, what do you think the chances are of your getting the idea you've been looking for all the days of your life? The law of averages is on your side. And one idea can make you rich. You only need one. You only need one oil well or one gold mine. And it's available in what you're now doing. This applies to anyone. 20 ideas a day. Becoming great as a, say, a salesman is no different, really, than becoming great at anything else. If you walked into a doctor or a lawyer's office and he didn't have a big... Uh, library full of books as reference material, you'd probably be a little suspicious of him, and rightly so. But the same thing applies to selling or any other field. There is no such thing as a good job or a bad one, or a good profession and a bad one. Our job is a job or a profession only in the way we handle it. And a salesman needs just as many books as a doctor. He's, he's got to know about the people that he wants to sell. He has to know about his product, about his company, and about the economy. He's got to know a lot of things. And the more he knows, the more he becomes a pro. The more he becomes a professional who is completely above, completely removed from economic cycles, ups and downs in our economy. This is the man who can write his own ticket, regardless of economic uh, conditions in the country. What do you suppose would happen if a young man went at his job for five years the same way a dedicated medical student has to go at the study of medicine? He'd be a national expert in five years. A national expert. And this would accomplish two things. One, he would have found a consuming interest, because when we get interested in our job, it sort of takes over. And secondly, he'd be economically sound for the rest of his life. He wouldn't have any problems about making money. We hear a lot about uh, security these days, this security business. And I think most people have got it backwards. You've heard people say, well, it isn't much of a job, but at least it represents security. There's no such thing as a job that represents security. If you say security in the same sentence with the word job, it's a non sequitur. It has no meaning whatsoever. If a man thinks his security rests on his job and then loses his job, he's lost everything. He's completely demoralized. He's like those people I saw back in 1933. He's lost everything. He's wiped out. Well, if security isn't a job, what is it? There's only one place you can find security. If it isn't there, it isn't anywhere. It's inside of a man. Inside, never outside. If a man has security inside where it belongs, you know it. His wife and children can feel it when he sits down to breakfast with them in the morning, and they're warmed by it. You can see it walking down the street. You can feel it when he enters a room. That's security. And you can take away that man's job or his money or anything else. Take away everything but a wife who's willing to start over, and all of them are. Drop him in any town in America and turn him loose. And you'll go back in a year and find him doing just as well as he was when you found him. You can't keep a good man down. Like cream on milk, you can shake it all day, but 
The minute you sit it down for a minute, it's going to bounce to the top again. That's security. And it comes from one place. Doing what we do for a living surpassingly well. Each one of us has a private continent, his own divine mind. We know it contains riches beyond belief. But how do you prospect a continent? You dig systematically and with purpose. And that's the way you prospect the mind, by thinking systematically and with purpose and setting the goal you want to reach. I was flying on an airplane someplace not too long ago. And I was reading a great play by the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Archibald MacLeish. And I ran across something in that play that made me sit bolt upright and think for about the next 15 minutes very seriously. He had written, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. Something to think about, isn't it? Everything that means anything to us is connected to us through our mind. Our love of our families, our patriotism, our religion, everything. And it's worth developing. He also said this, and this is sort of interesting. A man's face is his own fault after 40. And what determines what your face looks like is what you spend your evenings thinking about. In summing up then, set your goal, think, and act, and stay with it. Because today you have virtually no competition. I like what P.G. Hamerton wrote. He said, a strong life is like a ship of war, which has its own place in the fleet and can share in its strength and discipline, but which can also go forth alone to the solitude of the infinite sea. We ought to belong to society and have our place in it, and yet be capable of a complete and individual existence outside of it. We're living in the right country. We're living in the right time in history. Now it's up to us what we do with it. And remember the strangest secret. You will become what you think about. I want to thank you for letting me share this half hour with you. God bless you. Mr. Nightingale's unabridged talk on The Strangest Secret is available in LP record form for home study. For further information, write Earl Nightingale at 333 North Michigan Avenue, Chicago 1, Illinois, or see your program director.